Good evening to each and every one of you. Uh, we are so pleased and happy to uh, welcome each and every one of you, those who could make it and join us for the previous uh, and last webinars and the new ones that are joining us today. I'd like to say thank you for all the students that are joining and cooperating with us. Thank you for SPEBAU student chapter, SPLEU student chapter, uh, SPLU Romea student chapter, NDU Petroleum Engineering Society, Engineering Society at Finisea University and the ABG LU student chapter. Thank you for all of you. You are really making an amazing job. Uh, and I will give you a summary about uh, today's meeting agenda. We will start with an introduction about OBA, Online Internship Program, by engineer Omar Hamid, who is a business developer at uh, Online Petroleum Academy. Uh, then we will give a few uh, rules for the meeting and the webinar today. And we will then start our webinar uh, titled Organic Shell Evaluation and Development by Dr. Ahmed al uh, Assistant uh, Professor at uh, Merida Co College in USA. Uh, so, Omar, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Omar Hamid, business developer at OPA. Uh, as you saw in the video, and uh, uh, OPA offers an internship program that was also planned to take place this summer, but during to, uh, due to the circumstances and due to the pandemic that we're living in right now, and the uh, restrictions regarding the traveling, uh, OPA decided to make an initiative and uh, start with a unique online internship program. This internship program will be composed of two parts. The first part is on the softwares, where the participant will learn and participate to, uh, on two softwares on a high level uh, from instructors who are accredited the second part is a real case studies, which will be an analysis of real data and their applications in the field and comparing your decisions with the real ones taken by the companies. The duration of the internship will be mainly four weeks, but uh, we're also flexible to extend it up to eight weeks if the participants need that uh, extension. The, uh, for the first uh, part of the internship, those are the available softwares that participants can choose from. Uh, depending on uh, their priorities and their, uh, their program, their major. Uh, we have Petrol, Ambal, Techlog, Prosper, Aspen Heises, PVT Sim, Pipe Sim, OFM, Plateau, and Sapphire. The second part of the uh, internship, there will be real case studies, which will be presented by experienced engineers from the following companies, Schlumberger, Khalda, Petrobel, GPC, and Gapco. An engineer will be your mentor in this uh, part, and he will help you to understand and know how to use the data that will be provided to you and how to make decisions based on them. And the majors that can join are petro petroleum engineering, petrochemical engineering, geophysics, and geology. How to have the software, uh, the file will be uh, sent to you containing the software or the softwares that will be used during the internship. And uh, there will be also a guideline with it that will tell you how to install and activate this software to be prepared for the, uh, for the internship. The start date, it's uh, any time starting from 1 June until 20 June, depending on uh, the student's availability and preferred time. The number of participants will be between uh, 8 and 12 per intake. And uh, they can be either from the same university or from different universities, de depending on the uh, numbers and the preferences of the students. And if you're interested or have any questions regarding the online internship, please contact us through the email opa-lebanon at opacourses.com or through our Instagram at opa-lebanon. And thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. You know, um, uh, first, I appreciate the opportunity that OPA gave me to um, introduce this interesting topic to you. You know, the, today's topic will be introduction to uh, organic shale evaluation and development. And actually I teach this topic in one semester. So today all what we'll do is just I will give you a short presentation about it. Hopefully you will like it. Okay, so I will go through uh, what is shale what is shale evaluation, what is drilling pad, what is shale completion, and finally we'll uh, end by a conclusion, then I will 
be ready to take your questions. Okay, so first, what is shale? Shale is a dense sedimentary rock. So for sure we produce oil and gas from a sedimentary rock, okay? But the special thing here is that now we are producing from the source rock itself. If you get a class in geology before, they will teach you that we have a source rock, then a migration, then you know, for millions and millions of years, that, that organic uh, content there under high pressure and high temperature, it become hydrocarbon, right? And to start migrating from the source rock and it goes to um, a trap. The trap may be sandstone formation, maybe carbonate formation. This is what we call it a reservoir, a conventional reservoir. But today we are producing from the source rock itself. So the source rock in this case is uh, shale. And today I will teach you how to produce from shale, not from the sandstone formation or carbonate formation, what, what is you already know about and you already get uh, you know a lot of courses about. Okay, that organic uh, shale, from its name, I'm saying organic, so for sure there is organic material inside it, trapped inside it. But the main problem, it is extremely low permeability. It is really very, very low. It is nano Darcy. We measure permeability, you know, in, in conventional reservoirs like, you know, mainly Darcy. But in shale, we are talking about nano Darcy. So it is something like, you know, 10 to uh, power of minus nine or something. Okay. So for this situation, to develop that shale, I must do horizontal drilling. Look, it is not an option. You must do horizontal drilling. Second, you must do hydraulic fracturing, multi-stage hydraulic fracture, massive hydraulic fracture, huge job. Okay. And finally, we should use something we call slick water as a frac fluid. I believe many of you don't know what slick water, but you know, at the end of you know, after let's say 20 minutes. I have a slide about the history of slick water, so you'll get enough information about what is exactly slick water. Okay, so um, I got a question, why organic shale is important? Simply, a country like United States, they produce more than 50% of the oil production from shale. Do you know how much is that 50%? It is more than 5 million barrels a day from only United States. China, the produce from shale, Argentina they produce from shale, maybe no country in the Middle East produce from shale and I will tell you why later. Please remember this question, if I forgot to tell you, I, it, it would be nice if any of you uh, wrote me this question at the end, okay? So um, uh, why we don't have, why we don't develop organic shale in the Middle East, in Lebanon or in Egypt or in uh, Saudi Arabia, for example. So, as you see here, you know, the Permian Basin, this is in West Texas and east of New Mexico. Back in, this is in North Dakota, and all of these things are Eagle Ford, south of Texas. All of them, they, they are just shale formations. If you count, you will find more than 50% of United States oil production coming from shale. United States produce uh, around 13 million barrels of oil every day. Shale plays or location that we have organic shale almost everywhere in the United States. There is a lot of many and many uh, shale plays in the United States and in Canada also. Okay. So let me tell you something about how to evaluate a good shale play. Because, you know, um, uh, we have a shale play in, let's say, many shale plays in Egypt, but or maybe we have many shale plays in Lebanon. But the question is, is it feasible or not? Is it good ones or not? So let's uh, tell you something about how to give that judgment. Is it good or bad? Okay, so uh, this is like the, you know, the list of the topics. So let's get it started quickly. You know, first you need to uh, cooperate with the geologist. At this stage, you need to deal with the exploration team, which is almost a lot of geologists, okay? So a lot of geologists, petrophysicists. So it is not kind of engineering job at that level, but you need to be involved in that. So we need to do something like basin analysis. 
to know exactly how uh, the hydrocarbon formed and what is the passes of that migration. Okay, so I need to know where is the source rock, where is the conventional reservoirs. So later I will ask myself, if I go to these source rocks, is it good ones or bad ones? Is it what I can call sweet spot? Sweet spot is a good place in a shale so I can, uh, you know, put my drilling rigs and, you know, uh, drill wells and um, do hydraulic fracturing and frack and produce. So that good place, we call it sweet spot, shale sweet spot. Also, you need to ask yourself about the geologic uh, timing. <clears throat> is it the source rock in that place? Is it Cretaceous, Jurassic, or something else? And <clears throat> still, this is kind of uh, geology uh, job, not engineering job. Uh, also, I need you to, if you see a log for a shale, I need you to know how to uh, evaluate if it is a good shale, organic shale or not. So we expect to see high gamma ray. <clears throat> you will tell me what is special. We all know that in gamma ray, in, in shale, we have high gamma ray. Yeah, no. You will see gamma ray higher than expected. Okay, why? Because that organic matter includes some extra uranium. Okay, so you'll see more radiation. Also, in that shale, you will see um, uh, higher resistivity, more resistivity. Why we have more resistivity? Simply because there is hydrocarbon inside that shale. If there's hydrocarbon, you will see high resistivity. Make sense? I believe so. Okay. Also, we should have good porosity. If you don't have a good porosity, it means you don't have enough hydrocarbon to produce feasibly. So economic wise, it will not be a good decision to develop that place, okay? So we should have a good porosity because that porosity can give me a measure about how much hydrocarbon I have in that place. Also, I should have a good TOC. TOC stands for uh, total organic carbon. This is a measure by percentage for the uh, organic contents you have in that place, okay? And there is Two famous techniques named after you know, two scientists, two researchers who published papers about these techniques, PASI and the second one called Schmoker. So PASI and Schmoker, both of them, they have a method to measure the TOC only from the logs. Is it accurate? For sure, no, it's not accurate. But um, if you want something accurate, you, you need to do more logs, you need to invest more money. So at that stage, only I have some wells drilled in the place for conventional reservoirs, and I have some logs, and now I'm evaluating these logs. Okay, so this is the maximum you can do at that stage. It's just you use some correlation developed by Passy and Schmoker, and you can tell me something about uh, your expectation for the TOC. Is it 4%? Is it 3%? Is it 1%? and this is good or bad. Also, we need to know something about the maturity, the thermal maturity. This is the effect of pressure on temperature. How is that organic content get cooked? Is it well done, rare, or you know, um, uh, intermediate? Like when you go to a steakhouse in, or a restaurant, when you order a meat or a steak, they ask you about how good you, how the cooking you want. Is it um, you know, um, well done or rare or uh, intermediate, medium. Okay, so the hydrocarbon has something similar. If it is well done, it will be gas. If it is intermediate or rare, it will be condensate or oil. Okay, so this is uh, important to know. So I want to show you something, a good piece of work done by one of my advisors. His name is Richard Bateman. He's, you know, British guy, but you know, he was teaching at Texas Tech University. And I was one of his students. So he, he presented to us something very interesting that, you know, summarize a lot of information. Look, look to the mouse, the first one to the left, nine components model. This is all the nine components exist in the rock and what is inside the rock. 
So this is the rock, and this is what is inside the rock. So all together, and I can use all of that to get the bulk density. Let's check that. We have organic matrix. We have an organic matrix, like the sand, the carbonate. We have the clay solids. This is the clay contents, okay? We have how many? Six different liquids inside that, uh, you know, um, uh, not liquid, fluids inside that rock. Look, we have free water, we have cap bound water, we have clay bound water. This is the three different types of water we have inside the shade or inside any reservoir, any conventional reservoir. Look to the other side, we have oil, we have free gas, free gas in, inside the porosity of the that, you know, space. Also we have absorbed gas, a gas absorbed in the solid surface of that rock, okay? So th these are the nine content, the nine components we have at any rock, and you know I'm uh, also showing the you know the fluids and the rock itself. Look to the next one. Nine components with ability. This side we have free water, cap, uh, bound water, clay water, and for the clay solids and inorganic matrix, this is like water weight. Look to the other side. The organic matrix, we have oil, free gas, absorbed gas. This is um, uh, oil weight. I know you get the weightability in, 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 in your uh, uh, college. But here, just we are summarizing a lot of information, and I believe this will be helpful to you to let you imagine the rock, even if it is conventional or unconventional. Okay, look to the next one, seven component with hydrogen. You know the neutron log? It is all, only anything that has hydrogen. So it can see free water, the three types of water. It can see the three types of uh, hydrocarbon. Also, it can see the organic matrix. All of these things has uh, have uh, hydrogen. For the resistivity or the conductivity, the electric conductivity, I can get the three components of water. And finally, for the gamma ray, the radiation, the organic matrix, I told you it has some extra uranium, so it has some radiation. And also the clay itself has some radiation because of the you know, uh, uh, uranium, thorium, and potassium. Okay. For the well logging, I believe you get a class in well logging. There is something we call triple combo. Can anyone tell me what does triple mean? Look to the screen. Triple is three. Count, gamma ray, one. Resistivity, two. Density, three. Neutron, four. There are four things. We are measuring four things. So why we call them triple? There are four items. There are four logs. So why we call them triple, which is three? Simply because the density and neutron both of them, they are measuring the same thing, which is a porosity. So porosity is one, resistivity is two, gamma ray is three. This is why we call them triple. If you add sonic to them, sonic, which is you know uh, using dipole sonic, for example, the sonic wave, we call it quad combo. Quad means four. But if you count them, you will see five things. Okay, why? The same reason, because the density of neutron, both of them, they are measuring the porosity, okay? Why I'm teaching you something about conventional wood logging? Simply because for shale, we need to do some special wood logging. Like geochem logging, we have a tool um, that measure the elements inside that formation. And the tool itself can translate these elements into minerals. So if there is, let's say, five different minerals, all of them has aluminum, or all of them has uh, carbon, the tool using data mining techniques can translate each mineral to the right, each element, I'm sorry, each element to the right mineral. Okay, so the tool, we call it geochem law. There is many uh, companies working in that business. So we have 
Flex. This is uh, Baker Hughes. We have Jam. This is the name of the tool name. Flex is Baker Hughes. Jam is Halliburton. SES and Letho Scanner. This is Schlumberger. Okay. All of these tools, again, they tell you exactly the manuals inside the formation. Okay. So no conventional logging can tell you that. Okay. Something else. The MRI log, which is sometimes we call it NMRI log or MRI log. You know, if you if you are playing soccer or football and you broke your arm, you go to a doctor, he will do X-ray for you. Why X-ray? Because the X-ray can see the bones, but the X-ray cannot see the fluids inside your muscles. Right? If the injury you get not in the bone but the injury in the muscles, X-ray will not help. You must do magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. If someone has a severe headache for a long, long, long time, and he go and see a doctor, the doctor will tell him, hey, you need to do MRI for your brain just to be sure that there's nothing wrong there. There's no, you know, uh, you know um, there's nothing bad or, you know, um, uh, in the brain itself. So the MRI can see the fluids inside something. So why we are doing MRI for shale? Simply to get uh, information about the quantities of the fluid inside the rock, the volumes, also the properties of these fluids. I can know exactly these fluids if it is water or if it is gas or if it is uh, oil. So I can know exactly the type of the fluid, okay, using the NMRI log. Also, I can know the size of uh, the pools, so I can get a, a perfect measure for the porosity, and I can get a perfect measure for permeability. Not only that, I can also get accurate measure of what is producible of these fluids and what is not producible, which is, which is something like a magic. Okay, this kind of tools are very expensive but during the evaluation stage for shale, we, we need to do that. We need to do that. Okay, so I told you about the geochem log to get the um, min mineralogy of the formation. And now I told you about the NMRI that tells you about the fluids and permeability and porosity of that formation. The NMRI, it measures something called the relaxation time, T1, T2, and diffusivity coefficient. And based on that, I can differentiate between different types of hydrocarbons, different types of water, and uh, so on. Okay, so this is very, very helpful too. Okay, then I should do uh, cooling. Imagine the organic shale has, is 300 feet thickness. The thickness of the shale formation is 300 feet or 500 feet. Too sick. Do I need to call all of it during the evaluation? Yes. You need to call all of it, even if it is 500 feet. Okay, so we do cooling, full size cooling, like as you see in the picture. And we do this to uh, serve two jobs. First, Rock Eval company, there is a, 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 a you know, um, um, Geochem lab company will take some smaller cores to test the uh, TOC, to test the S1, S2, S3, and I will tell you exactly what is that, you know, very soon. And also there is a second company uh, do the geomechanics of the rock mechanics testing. I need to have to know something about the youngest modulus, Poisson's ratio, the, this kind of mechanical properties. Because this kind of thing is very important to uh, to do a good design for a hydraulic track job, okay? So for the rock eval, this helped me to evaluate if the, this sweet spot or this location is good or bad, and the rock mechanics will tell me something about uh, how to optimize my hydraulic fracturing job. Okay, here is the um, geochem lab or the rock eval, you know, as you see here, you know, Pyrolysis testing, I'm heating something until I burn it. Okay, look, 
here is the S1. S1, this is like the amount of free hydrocarbon, amount of free hydrocarbon, gas or oil in the sample. End of testing. Okay. The S2, look, this is the S1. Look at the mouse. This is the S1. Here is the S2. S2 is the amount of hydrocarbon generated through thermal cracking of uh, non-volatile organic matter. So the carrier itself of the hydrocarbon and burning it itself. I have a free gas and free oil. When I burn it, I get the S1. When I burn the carrier itself, the kerogen itself, I get the S2 and the T max. And S3, this is the volume of the CO2. You know, whenever we burn something, we get some uh, CO2 at the end, okay? And so this is exactly what we do in pyrolysis analysis or, you know, in the chem lab uh, company. And we do this figure, look to the mouse again, we have a fluid inside that formation from type one or type two or type three or type four. I know exactly the type of hydrocarbon I would produce. Is it gas? Is it condensate? Is it oil? So I use uh, this figure, what we call, you know, Van uh, Krevlin diagram. This is the name of a guy who developed the technique. And this will help me to know exactly the kind of hydrocarbon I would produce. This is kind of a report. The table is a report of I get from a geochem uh, lab company. They tell me the S1, S2, the productivity index, the Tmax, the TOC, the hydrogen index. And I can use these things to confirm exactly the type of fluid. Look, I am almost know nothing about that formation. Now I'm evaluating. This is why I'm, I'm telling you I need to do a lot of extra work, extra well logs, special logs. And now I do um, um, uh, coring and I, go, I, I send this course to rock mechanic testing. I send them to um, uh, geochem testing because I know nothing about that formation and I need to collect as much as possible to optimize my frag design or to decide is it worth to uh, invest billions of dollars in that location or not. The investment in shale, it is billions of dollars, okay? Here is, to the left, a table from a, geo, uh, uh, from a rock mechanics company. It tells me information about the compressive strength, Young's models, Poisson's ratio. Okay, this helped me to know the mechanical properties of the formation. There is something we use in shale, something we call brittleness index, and there is an equation to calculate brittleness index. This equation here, we call it Rickman equation, simply because the guy who introduced this equation, his name is Richard Rickman. He was working for Halliburton and he published this paper in 2008. So we used to call this equation Rickman equation. He used, he used uh, youngest models, static youngest models and static Poisson's ratio to calculate something called brittleness index. The brittleness index is 10%, 20%, 70%. So it is a percentage. Whenever we, ha we have high brittleness index, it means this is favorable, this is very good for the uh, hydraulic fracturing. So we, we like to have high brittleness index. If you are fracking a formation, brittle formation, you will get excellent result and you will produce a lot of oil. If that formation is ductile, it is too complicated to produce good amount of gas or oil out of it and this will affect the type of frac fluid you will use. And I will tell you how later. Okay, again, this is a case study from somewhere in the Western desert of Egypt. I believe all of you, you know, many of you went to Egypt. So this is from a location belongs to Khalda. Before I came to Natchez, I was working for Khalda. So, um, and this is confirming that we have a condensate and oil in that location. Look, here is the Tmax and hydrogen index. Here is Poisson's ratio and youngest models. This tells me this formation is brittle, something like 60, 70%, okay? Also here's the TOC, the S2, and this is the oxygen index with, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen index. All of these things confirming that we have a liquid hydrocarbon, most likely condensate, okay? So, we have high brittleness, we have 
oil window, it means like I'm producing oil of condensate. Also, we have a conventional behavior. Conventional behavior means what? I have a set shale formation, but there is a, a tiny small layer conventional in the middle, like a small 10 feet of sand and this sand saturated with condensate to oil. So we consider that little one like a, com a little or a small conventional reservoir inside the middle, you know, in the middle of the shale itself. Okay, so we have conventional behavior. It means we have this kind of tiny little sands or carbonate saturated with hydrocarbon in the middle of the shale itself. Okay, here is a technique we, we, we developed like a few years ago and we call it sweet spot quality index. Sweet spot quality index, I told you a sweet spot means a good place inside that shale that we put our drilling rig and we drill many hundreds of wells. So that excellent location, we call it sweet spot. But we need to have a measure or something to grade or scale these sweet spots. If, we, if I, if I want to compare a sweet spot in West Desert of Egypt with a second one in Lebanon, with a third one in Saudi, with a fourth one in the United States, we need to have a scale for that. So this technique, we have something we call a reservoir lock to the mouse, to the top of that you know, shape, polygon. RQI, this is a reservoir quality, this is a measure for reservoir quality index. To the right, this is completion, this is conventional behavior index. If I have this kind of tiny, small layers or not, at the bottom, this is completion quality index. And to the left, this is operation index. Operation index includes the, the price of the gas, the price of the operations, the availability of the uh, equipment, the horsepower, there's a lot of things. So to evaluate a shale, and put it in a graphical shape in front of a decision maker. If he, if I see this, I would say, hey, it seems like this formation has very high completion quality index. It means this very brittle formation. If I see to the right, CPI, which is conventional behavior, it seems like there is some tiny layers inside it. Just when I look to the shape, I understand that. To the other side, it is, you know, for the operation index, it is two. It seems like the oil price is not that high, but it's still, you know, okay. Okay. We need the high oil price to, you know, produce shale without a problem, especially some, some shale plays are very deep and drilling, the, drilling, you know, it would be very expensive. Okay. Let's keep moving. You know, this is like a definition. Uh, let me check that time because I don't want to, you know, I'm, uh, Okay, so this is like a definition of what is reservoir quality index, what is completion quality index, what is conventional behavior, what is operation index. This is what I just told you in the slide. Okay, the case study to the left, this is from the Western Desert in Egypt, and I was trying to compare it with some shell plays in the United States. Marcellus, Burnett, Eagle Ford, Hinesville, all of them, good shell plays in the United States. So I, I, I was trying to compare the one we have in Egypt with, with these things. Okay, let me tell you something special about drilling, drilling for uh, organic shale. We have something we call drilling pad. A drilling pad is just one location, one small location in the surface, and I use it to drill maybe up to 12 wells from the same place. So one drilling location, and I drill up to 12 wells, six. If you see the mouse for this one, you see there are three wells to that direction and there are three wells to the other direction. I can have up to 12 wells, so six to that direction and six to the other direction. Why this is uh, good for drilling? You can use only one rig and you can rotate. You can drill the first surface, uh, you know, uh, you know the, uh, when we drill, we drill the surface uh, part first, then we go for the intermediate, then we go for the lateral, right? So 
so I can develop the first, the, the surface part of the first well. Then I can move the rig, push the rig, walk the rig. There is a slider for the rig, like the, you know, when you um, have a skating board or something. So the drill, this kind of drilling rigs as something similar. When you finish drilling the first surf, the surface part of the first well, you can push the rig to the, like, uh, something less than 10 feet, uh, sorry, uh, something like five meters. So it is very small. Then I can have the well head of the second well. Then I push the rig again after I finish drilling the surface plate, the surface location, the surface part of the, uh, the well, and drill the third one, the fourth one, and so on. Then after I finish the first, the surface part, I go backward and I drill the intermediate, then I go backward and I drill the latter, the last one. So why we are doing this? To save money, to save time. Okay, we call that drilling pad. Look to the picture to the left. We have a lot of drilling locations beside each other. This is for machine play. Can you imagine how much money we are investing here? It is billions of dollars. Okay. Okay, let me tell you something about shale completion. Okay, so shale completion. Whenever we say shale completion or unconventional completion, it means I'm talking about the hydraulic fracturing. Okay, so uh, we don't have the same logic we, we use when we frack um, uh, sandstone formation. Why? Because this is unconventional reservoir. It is really unconventional. So we have something we call complex fracture network. It means I need to fracture almost everything in, inside the shale. I should frack every single foot inside the shale. Okay? So we need to have something we call complex fracture network. I need to connect all this shale together. Why again? Because the permeability is very, very small extremely low, so I need to frack everything. Look to these two wells, what we call zipper frack. You know, zipper <coughs> in English, <coughs> sorry. So zipper means, um, you know, um, there's something you have in your jacket, you know, in Arabic we call it sosta. So this is what, what, what we call zipper, okay? So I will tell you why we call it zipper, because I start, look to the mouse, please. I start, you know, uh, perforating and fracking this, this zone. Then I move to the, the next well, the second well. Then I move back again to the first well. Then I move to the second well. Then first well, second well. So it looks like a shape of a zipper, like a Z shape also, okay? So also when I inject a lot of fluid, I need to use a new term called uh, stimulated reservoir volume. I need to have a volume that this is already uh, stimulated and this is already will produce a lot of oil or a lot of gas after uh, opening that well for production. So uh, in, in softwares, like, you know, frac simulators for shale, you will find something called complex fracture network or modeling of complex fracture network. Also you'll find a volume what we call SRV or stimulated reservoir volume. Also, one of the inputs you will use, the well spacing, which is the distance between the two laterals. This is the well spacing. You know, at near the surface, all the wells are beside each other, like maybe six wells or 10 wells or 12 wells, they are beside each other, like a few meters be, be, between the well heads. But underground, you will find something like maybe 500 feet be between the uh, two laterals. Okay, so we call that well spacing. Okay, stages, what is a stage? Okay, to frack, I cannot frack all the horizontal section at the same time. Why? I don't have enough fluids to do it in, 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 in the same time. I don't have pumps can do that at the same time. So operation wise, this is not doable. So I have two teams working in the location. 
a wireline team do plug and perf. We call it plug and perf team. A second team, we call it the pumping team. This is the, the, the hydraulic traction company. So there's two companies working, wireline company for plug and perf and pumping company for the hydraulic fraction. Okay, so we, um, uh, let me, I was trying to explain to you what is the perfect, but let me wait for the next slide or the next two slides. Also, I need to think about the volumes injectives. Okay, so please, I wanna give you this question and try to think about it, okay? What should be that the, I told you there's two companies working in the location, wireline for plug and perf and pumping uh, company. What's a company, what's a, if the pumping company working in a well, what should be the other company doing? Nothing, they are waiting. When the plug and perf company, the wireline company working, what should be the other company, the, uh, the, the pumping company doing, they are doing nothing, they are waiting. Okay, so a lot of engineers were, we were trying to think about a way or a method to make these two teams working together at the same time. And they developed what we call zipper fracturing. So during the time that the plug and perf company working in well number one, here. So the first thing I will do, near the toe, I will perforate using the wireline company. Then the pumping company will start injecting the first treatment here. At that time, the plug and perf company perforating the second well. Then the pumping company will go and, you know, uh, and, and, and pack the second stage in the first well. At that time, the plug and perf go back to the first well, so they keep switching together. They keep switching together. So by doing this, you can keep the two company, the two companies busy 24 hours. So this is uh, what we call zipper fraction because the two companies they are keep switching, 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 switching together in the two worlds at the same time. Okay. Let me tell you what is slick water. You know, and if you if you attended a frag job, we use something like jello. Very viscous fluid. This is a frag fluid. This is a conventional frag fluid, right? If you if you don't see that before, just go to YouTube, right? Frac, viscous frag fluid, and you will see something very viscous in a you know in a, a big uh, jug or a big cup. And when you ever whenever you you know make it like this. The best, that fluid start to, you know, very elastic, try to, you know, uh, trip down in the ground. When you get it back, very elastic, okay? So this is very expensive, that fluid very expensive. So around maybe um, 20 years ago, a guy from, um, you know, uh, he's an American guy, but his dad and mom from um, uh, Greece. So he's Greek immigrant. His name is George Mitchell. He get on a crazy idea to use uh, only water injected in a very high pressure, very high rate, around 100 barrel per minute. And to do that, there's a lot of friction in the tubing. To avoid that friction, he used a lot of friction reduce, reducing material, a chemical. So fresh water plus friction reducing material equal slip water. So this is what we call slick water. Slick water is very cheap, just a chemical and water, that's it. And he can pump up to 100 barrel in one minute, okay? This uh, make a booming success in Barnett Shale and everybody start copying him, copying that experience. And all the companies start reporting that they get uh, higher production after they did that. So they use cheaper material, which is slick water, and they get more production, which is amazing. Okay, let's go back to what is a zipper frack. I'm almost told you that the zipper frack, we were trying to enhance the efficiency of the operation. I told you there's two teams working, and whenever one, team number one work, team number two 
stay doing nothing, just waiting. And whenever team two walk, team number one do nothing and wait. So developing the zipper pack or completing two wells at the same time, tracking two wells at the same time, what we call zipper pack, it was a way to enhance the operation efficiency. The good news that all companies, almost all companies, they did zipper pack, they reported higher production rate, something like 30% higher. So it was, uh, you know, uh, amazing news. Okay. And I told you why we call it zipper, because, you know, uh, we, we use, you know, we go from well one to well two, then we go back to well one to well two. So it looks like a zipper. Okay. So um, here's like a summary about the advantage and disadvantage of, uh, of a zipper fact. You know, um, um, again, we developed the effect to enhance uh, the operation, but the good news is that we get around 30% increase in the production rate. And, you know, um, um, so uh, right now in the United States, um, there's a lot of activities for zipper fracking. Okay, so this is simply how we complete uh, wells here in the United States. We do multi-stage fracking, like we frack, you know, every single foot in the lateral section, we do them in the stages and each stage, imagine that example to make it closer to your mind. Let me go back to this figure. So look to the first well, well one. Okay, so these fractures, this is stage one and this is stage two, this is stage three. So one lateral composed of or consists of multiple stages. And each stage consists of many clusters. And each cluster acts like one hydraulic fracture. Okay, so for one well, for one well, listen please, listen please. For one well, you can inject up to four million gallon of water sometimes reach 5 million gallon of water for only one well. So it means you, knew, you need huge amount of water. Even in Egypt, we, there is a, a, a river, but there is not enough water to do that. In Lebanon, I don't know how you know, enough fresh water you have, but the bad news is that in, in fracking, we must use fresh water, which is a, um, you know, a problem in many, many countries. In the United States, there is no problem at all in fresh water. It rains, you know, um, all the year and there's lakes everywhere. So there's no problem in fresh water. And this is one of the main reasons why we cannot develop organic shale in the Middle East. Libya and Algeria, they have huge reserve of uh, shale gas and shale oil, but they don't have fresh water. So they cannot uh, develop it. Okay, finally, I will start by my conclusion. You know, organic shale can develop millions and millions of oil uh, barrels every day. And also, you know, um, um, trillions of, you know, of, of uh, standard cubic feet of gas every day. And uh, it is very crucial here in the United States. You know, we almost get like 50 to 60% of oil of United States production out of these shale plays. And uh, um, as a summary, we should have a good brittleness, we should have a good TOC, we should have, uh, you know, the suitable, uh, you know, um, uh, thermal maturity we want. And also we should have a good oil and gas price to develop it because developing shale is more expensive compared with developing conventional uh, reservoirs. I will stop here and I'm ready to uh, take your questions, please. So please, if you have a question, just you know, uh, write it in the chat and I will read it and I will try to, uh, I will do my best to answer it. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this amazing topic and interesting session. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, what is the scientific reason behind the, the increased production 
by using the, the zebra frack and working on both of those at the same time. Okay, this is an excellent question. Look to this figure. Okay, first at that time we almost know nothing about complexity or complex fracture network. If you look to the, that first stage here and the, the next stage in the, in the, you know, in the will two, they are communicating together. The fracture is the first stage and the first, the first stage in will one and the first stage in will two, they are communicating together and increasing the complexity, increasing the passes between inside the formation. So we get a better uh, hydraulic fracturing treatment. That complexity or that complex fracture network we, we created, we get uh, more oil and more gas. And actually we did not uh, mean to get that. I mean, it was uh, unintentional. So when we did that, just we were trying to, um, you know, um, uh, enhance the efficiency of the, you know, just keep the two companies busy at the same time. But when we did that, because of that, you know, integrate or reaction between the stages in the first well and the second well, they are uh, staggered together and build that complex, complex network between them. And we get more passes and better overall permeability and we get more oil and more gas. Is it clear? Yes, it's uh, so clear. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Melissa. Why we use uh, fresh water? Why we use fresh water? Because there's something I believe you got it in your school called formation damage. You may damage your reservoir. Damage your reservoir means there is a permeability inside the formation. And if you have any kind of bad solids, something not dissolvable in water, it can stuck in, in, inside these you know, um, uh, passes between inside the formation and plug the formation. Okay, so uh, why we use fresh water? Because if you use seawater, the seawater has a lot of salts, and this salt will damage your formation, will plug your formation, and ends up producing nothing. So you must use a fresh water with exact specifications. So whenever we get a, a fresh water in Egypt, in, in let's say in a location for Halda Petroleum Company, we need to test that water. We we'll check how much phosphate, how much uh, iron, how much whatever, and we, we should, you know, decide if it is okay to use it in fracking or we decline on, and reject that uh, tank. Yeah. There's a reason if you use seawater or salt water, it will damage your formation and you will not produce anything or if you if we are optimistic, it will produce very little. Uh, Muhammad Azim has the same question, so we hope we got the answer. Uh, what is the next question? I think Harris Ahmed is asking, uh, is there any classification for shear uh, on the type of organic matter it contains? Okay, so the shear itself, I, I care about how much organic material I have. So if the, if the, what we call TOC, so if the, if the shear is, let's say 1%, the TOC is 1% or 2% or 5%, you need to decide that 5% is good for you or not, because maybe it, you have 5%, but the, the price is very, very low. So if you develop, you will not get money back from that business, okay? So all the time, whenever you do, you do something, you connect that with the oil price, is it good or not? So uh, the TOC, it, it tells you something about how much uh, you know, organic matter you have, and the thermal maturity, the value for the thermal maturity will tell you something about the type of that hydrocarbon. When you frack it, you will produce oil or condensate or um, uh, gas. So we, we care about the TOC, the total organic carbon and the thermal maturity. This will give you enough information about what you are asking for. Uh, Mustafa Tarek is asking about uh... Can we apply acidizing to produce from shale? Yes, sir, we can do that, but we use some acids at the beginning of frack job, of, of fracking every stage to lower the breakdown pressure. And you do this only 
if that shale includes a good amount of carbonate. Let's say if you have a shale and there is no carbonate at all in that shale. So why you are using acid? The acid will not react with anything, okay? If you have good amount of, uh, of carbonate, you can use some HCl at the beginning of each stage you are packing. Why? To lower down the breakdown pressure of the formation of, uh, and save some money out of the horsepower of the pumps you, you are saving. Okay. Uh, Abdul Rahman Morgan is asking, is shale good for oil? Uh, I don't think we, we have a clear okay. question. There, 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 is organ there is shale for there is shale produce oil, and there is other shale plays produce gas, and there is some other shale plays produce condensate. So um, a, a state like North Dakota, they have a, a big shale play called uh, Bakken, and they produce more than 1 million barrel of oil every day. You know, in Egypt, they produce like 700,000 uh, or maybe 600,000 oil uh, barrel of oil every day. So North Dakota, out of that shale, they produce double of Egypt production of oil every day. Okay. So you can produce oil or gas or condensate based on the location and the thermal maturity of that location. Uh, Sharif Muhammad is asking about, uh, can we reuse uh, the injected fresh water after the well is bottom production and fracturing in other wells? Yes, we, we, we do that. You know, there is a flow back whenever we, we frack uh, the well. As, as, as I told you, we, we inject like 4 million gallons of water for only one well. So whenever you open that well for production, you get like 30, 40, 50% of that water back as a backflow. So we can take this water, do some treatment to make it reusable, or you know, um, uh, so I can reuse this water in new uh, fracks. Or if not, if it is expensive to do that treatment, I can inject it as a disposal, or you know, send it to a water flooding project or, or a disposal. But yes, we, we use a portion of that water we inject. When we get it back, we, we use it again. Uh, so William Sayer was asking, uh, uh, economically uh, speaking, do, do you think the shale industry can survive a long-term low price, low oil price, and what are the possible ways to decrease the break-even price? Okay, I mean, below $40, below $40, Shale should not survive, but the situation in the United States is very special. The government help and support these producers to survive. So you see oil of $10 or $20, and they're still producing. Why? Because the government of the United States, they are supporting them. They even if, if they can get uh, cheaper oil from Saudi or from Kuwait, they will not do that, and they will keep uh, supporting their, you know, uh, smaller uh, producers here in the United States for, you know, for political reasons and, you know, for economic reasons, you know, um, but again, the, you know, Saudi in 2014 and OPEC, they were trying to stop or kick uh, these small producers here in the United States out of business, but they failed, they, they failed to do that. Why? Because the government of the United States supporting these small companies. Uh, Nizar Al Hakim is asking about uh, the challenges that we face uh, in the environment for the zebra fracking. Okay, fracking. You know, in Europe, in many countries in Europe, they, they stop fracking. Why? Because we use a lot of chemicals, and these kind of chemicals may harm the environment. But here in the United States, there is one of the candidates from the uh, Democrats. She was, her name is, I believe, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren. And part of the program, she said, hey, I will ban fracturing. I will fracturing. If I win, if I become a president of the United States, I will ban fracturing. When she said that, everybody stopped laughing. Do you know why? No one in the United States is ready to lose 60% of the country production just because uh, a lady likes to uh, support the environment. This is uh, maybe a nice statement, but not to lose 6 million barrels of oil every day. No one will like that. If you do it, 
millions of people will lose jobs. So okay. um, uh, in, in Europe, it is a different situation. Here in the United States, there is two big political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. Both of them, they are business oriented and both of them, they are economic oriented. But in Germany, for example, there is a green party, green political party, and even if the, uh, let's say, the prime minister or whatever, you know, the guy who controlling the, the, the country, trying to stop banning the, the hydrofracturing, these political parties will refuse because the environment political parties in, in Europe, they are very strong and they have a lot of support of people. But in the United States, no. There is no, you know, only the Republicans and Democrats and both of them, they like to have jobs and business, and both of them, they don't care much about environment. Sadly to say that. Uh, but Samuel Ghul is asking about the additives. What kinds of addit additives that we add to the fracturing water, uh, to the slick water? Okay, the slick water, there's, there's many materials we use. We call it friction reducer. This is just a chemical to reduce the friction with pipes. So there is a lot of different chemicals can do that. Imagine something very simple, you know what is glycerin, right? So imagine that we are getting some of this glycerin and we add it with water. We make that water a little bit viscous or a little bit, you know, um, uh, you know, slippery. So whenever it goes in a pipe, it will reduce the friction. So it is just a type of chemical can reduce the friction between the water and the pipe and make it possible to uh, pump up to 100 barrel per minute, which is not doable if you are not using a friction reducer. Okay, uh, Sharif is asking about, uh, in the geological analysis, do we care about uh, S1 or S2? The S1, S2, the S1, S2, and S3, this is the pyrolysis analysis. And when you get them, it will give you something, uh, it will tell you something about the type of hydrocarbon you have in that formation. There's a one big question mark. If we develop here, we will produce gas or oil because simply they have two different prices. You like to have oil, right? Yes. Because oil most likely more, uh, more expensive. Make sense? But yes. to, to do your evaluation, you need to know exactly what should be the something you are producing because later you will sell it and get some money and you need to evaluate how much money you will get. So the S1, S2, S3, this is not geology. This is evaluating the type of fluid of hydrocarbon you will produce. Geology will help you to, you know, when, when you do the basin analysis, for example, to know exactly where is your source rock where is your source rock and how the, that migration happened and where is the conventional reservoirs. And for sure they do that for, you know, for normal activity of the exploration team in, at any big company. We actually have many other questions, but we are running out of time. So we will take a couple of questions uh, more. Uh, Loai is asking why the Middle East has conventional reservoirs? I don't know if we, if this uh, what you mean from the question. Yeah, I got, I got, I got, I got his question. He is asking why we are producing conventional when why we are not producing the shale, for example. There is many reasons for that. Simply, in in Middle East, we have a lot of easy oil. You know, in Saudi, it is easy to drill everywhere and get oil, so it is cheaper. Okay, in Saudi, they don't have fresh water to develop for uh, organic shale. There is a lot of tight sand in, in, in Saudi. There is a lot of shale plays in Saudi, but they cannot produce it based on today's technology. They need to wait until something big happens that way. Hey, in fracking, we, we don't need that amount of water anymore, or something like that to happen. So in, in Saudi, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya, in Algeria, for example, there is a lot of shale but they cannot produce it, they cannot develop it, just because they don't have enough water. Also, they don't have enough horsepower. We need a lot of pumps in these locations. And why you invest uh, in something very hard and difficult to get, and you have a lot of easy 
uh, reservoirs you can develop. This is the, uh, the Saudi story. They can produce up more than 10, 11 million barrels a day, easy ones. So why do you go for uh, developing shale right now? Maybe they will do later. Maybe. Uh, Zaina Judea is asking, uh, this is the last question. Uh, clay is rich in radioactive elements and has a higher, uh, a high gamma ray values as well. Uh, yes. How do we differentiate shales from clays in uh, log analysis? Okay, so th this is a very good question. Let me go back to that slide. So at that case, at that, you know, so during evaluating if that shale is organic or not, organic rich or not, is it this one? No. I forgot what is it, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, I remember what, what I should say. So the clay itself, has high uh, gamma ray, right? But whenever we have organic matter, and that organic matter also includes some extra uranium. So now we have extra radioactive material. So I'm expecting to see, you know, something higher than average of radioactivity. So the gamma ray will be a little bit higher, but this is, it is not only that. I need also to check the resistivity. If there is high resistivity, if there is high resistivity, it means there is, high, there is a hydrocarbon inside the chain. And this makes sense. Makes sense why? Because if there is a lot of water inside the chain, water has source and this will be conductive. So the resistivity will not be high. Whenever you have high resistivity, it is a good sign of um, uh, having hydrocarbon. Maybe you have higher resistivity just because you don't have any porosity. But when you check the porosity and you see the neutron and density and you know that you have a good porosity, so it means there's only one chance that you have hydrocarbon inside the chain. So the gamma ray will tell you exactly this is a shale and also you will expect to see higher, a little bit gamma ray. You will see higher resistivity and this confirms there's hydrocarbon there and you will check the neutron and density to check to see if there is uh, a porosity or storageability of that hydrocarbon or not. And uh, as I told you, based on the information you have at that stage, later I will ask to do a uh, geochem log and I will ask to do an MRI log. Also, I will ask to do cooling. And we do these things only in the evaluation stage. Whenever we know everything about that location, we will never do these things. And what we'll do, we will drill, frack, that's it. Drill, frack, that's it. Hopefully this answers the yeah. question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your time and effort. Uh, this, is, was, this was a very interesting and uh, outstanding session.